Let us continue in worship now as we hear the morning prelude. verses 1 and 2. Rid yourselves therefore of all malice and all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. The second reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 46 through 50. While he was still speaking to the crowds, his mother and his brothers were standing outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak with you. But to the one who had told him this, Jesus replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whosoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. <clears throat> Mothers are amazing, aren't they? They enable us to uh, maintain the responsibilities that we've committed ourselves to. There was one mother, and she woke up her son on a Sunday morning and she said, honey, it's time to get up and go to church. And he said, I don't want to go to church today. And she said, but you need to go to church. I'm going to church. You need to come to church. And, and she said, um, and he said, I don't want to go to church. And she said, well, give me two reasons why you don't want to go to church. And he said, well, because there's something on TV that I want to watch later in the morning and also, sometimes the sermons are so boring, I think I'm never going to last through the whole thing. And uh, she's like, but you have to go to church. And he said, well, give me two reasons why I have to go to church. And she says, well, the first one is you're 52 years old, and it's about time you grew up. And the second one is you're the pastor, and people are <laughs> expecting you to be there to give the sermon today. So, um, yeah. What are some of the favorite things about your mother? When you think about your mother, a few of the favorite things, whether your mother is with you or whether she's passed on. What are some of the things? She's always there to listen to your troubles. All right. Always there. Always offer a big hug and a concern. A hug and a concern. Yes. She's caring and proud of you. Caring and proud of you. A sense of humor. Wisdom. Wisdom. She tells, you, uh, tells, it like tells it like it is. That honesty. Always found something good about a person. Anything else? Did I miss anyone in the choir? I, I think of, yes. So anyone who was around, if she baked something that they loved, she'd invite everyone in to have some yummy thing. Um, so I'm sure you're thinking of other things about your mother. We don't name them all, but um, today is the day we celebrate all the special things about our mothers. And 
and the way they have nurtured and cared for us and self-sacrificed so that they've been able to be there for us. And we want to honor mothers today. So all of you who are moms and all of you, which is everyone who have moms, um, we lift them up and we think of them and we just offer them up to God. For some people, Mother's Day is the very hardest Sunday of the year. Um, if you don't have a good relationship with your children or if you have a child that has died or if your mother has passed on, even though you want to honor her, you know, it's very poignant to think about her and to remember all the things that she was for you or if you wanted to have children and weren't able to or if you've decided not to have children. That Mother's Day can be a tough day when some people feel left out of it. And so we want to acknowledge all of those people that have a hard time today on Mother's Day and just lift you up to God and, and let you know that uh, you're in God's arms and in God's loving care, too. And I think the other thing about Mother's Day is that sometimes on Mother's Day we think about all the amazing things about our mother and sometimes we think about the challenges or maybe the failures of being a mother. Um, I, I think about, you know, that first few weeks when I was a mother for the first time and I had all these idyllic ideas of what it was going to be like and my son had colic and he cried. Any of you have had kids with colic? Day and night, yeah. So you, you know what I'm talking about. Like, you're walking this kid around, and you're thinking, God, please help me love this child. Uh, you know, I just, I, I don't know how much longer I can deal with this. And, um, and my husband, too, would walk him around all the time, and, you know, I would bounce him on the bed, and, um, and my neighbor was incredible because she said, you can call me any time, day or night. She said, I don't sleep that well at night, so I'm usually awake. And I remember one time, I just couldn't handle it anymore. I called it at 3 in the morning. She came over. She held my son, and he was asleep like that. Like, what's the matter with me? Um, but uh, there are those times, you know, in parenting. And, and I just remember... There are many times, but another one came to mind um, this past week when I was thinking about the challenges of motherhood when I was home and I was getting dinner ready uh, for when Bruce came home and I was ironing the clothes and our, our son was a toddler, you know, kind of crawling around on the floor. And I was just moving around quickly and I dropped the iron on my foot. And I dropped a few words, too, at the same time. <laughs> Now, of course, if I say mama or daddy, you know, the son isn't going to repeat them. But the minute I say this word, which let's just say it was the word sugar, <laughs> he started saying sugar, 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 sugar. You know, this is a pastor's kid. And, and my husband comes in, and there he is in his high chair. He's going, sugar, 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 sugar. And my husband's like, what is he saying? I'm like, uh, I don't understand him. And he's like, I think he's using a curse word. And he's going, sugar, 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 sugar. And I said, well, I had a really bad day. That's all I can say about that. And, you know, these are things that in the moment you feel like I'm going to pull all, every single hair out of my head. Uh, but later on, you can laugh about it. But there, there are other times where our parenting just breaks open our heart and makes us feel like our guts are spilled out all over the place. Um, like when your child is sick, you know, no matter what age they are, when they're sick and you don't know how to make it better. And you, know, you as the parent, you want to, but you just can't make it better. Or when they get their driver's license for the first time and you, know, you watch them pull out of the driveway on their own and you're like, God, please 
um, take care of this child, protect this child, or when you get the call that they've been in a car accident, or just all of that treacherous time. I think from age 13 to 25, when you know your child is like on the precipice, you know, they're trying to figure out who they are, and you just pray that they're not going to step over into the place where you don't want them to be, and that they're going to stay on the good side of it as they explore their identity and good and bad and how to make friends and who to be friends with. And it's especially challenging in this day and age when they can see anything they want to see on the Internet, and so you can't protect them from information. And uh, the opioid crisis is striking close to home all the time. And so those are the times that you just... Just cry out to God and say, I, I can't do it on my own. You know, I can't do it on my own. In the scripture, people say to Jesus, your mother and brother are here. And Jesus says, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Anyone who follows the will of God is my mother and my brother. And I think what he's saying is, we can't do it on our own. You know, it's, it's so hard, this job of nurturing ones into adulthood, whether it's our own children or whether we're an aunt or a school teacher. We just can't do it on our own. We need a community of people to be there with us when we fail. I don't know what I would have done if my next door neighbor hadn't been able to come over. I probably would have just cried myself to sleep for the rest of the night with my kid laying crying on top of me. But I think that's what Jesus is reminding us, is that we can't do these things on our own, these difficult tasks that expect so much of us, that call so much from us. Um, and so even mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or aunt or uncle aren't enough. It takes so many people to be able to help us to walk into adulthood. There was a letter in Dear Abby, which I love to read. I love to see how her advice has changed over the years, you know, as she's changed people. But um, it said, um, my best friend's son is being bullied at school by a group of the athletes that he hangs around with. And I think it's very destructive to him. And I've talked to his parents about it. And they think he should just be tougher. And they're saying, you just could, should keep doing this and uh, playing the sport and hanging out with these children. And I don't know what to do. What should I do? And uh, dear Abby writes back and says, um, you need to be a friend to your friend's son. You need to talk to him. You need to let him know that you accept him exactly as he is. And you need to let him know that you will stand with him no matter what. And Abby ended, this may be a life or death choice for you and for him. Remind you how important it is, you know, to be a friend, to be willing to step in and help a parent as they're struggling along. And there are so many times in our lives I want to invite you to think about all of the people in your own life who weren't related to you in any way, who have made a difference along the way, and how important that has been. So today we celebrate the nurturing and compassion and care we've received from our mothers and that mothers have given their children, but we also celebrate the many, many people who've expressed a mother's love. There's so many uh, scriptures about how God is a father, and we often think of God as a father, but there are a number of scriptures that talk about God as the quintessential mother, too. In Hosea, they were in my arms, and I led them with the cords of human kindness and the bands of love, and they were like infants who were lifted up to my cheeks and I bent down to them, and I fed them. I was like a mother bear robbed of her cubs, and I protected them. Or in Isaiah, as a mother comforts her child, I'll comfort you. Will a mother never forget the child of her womb? I will never forget you. Or in Matthew and Luke, 
just as a hen gathers her chicks to herself. I want to gather you into my arms, O oh, Jerusalem. I want to protect you. I want to keep you from harm. So we're reminded that this love, this self-sacrificing love that we call mother love is the love of God that comes in and through us, and it's the kind of love that we can all share with one another. I think of, um, got some pictures here of this family, Jessica and Josh Clark adopted seven children on May 9th, just a few days ago. Isn't that incredible? They didn't set out to adopt seven children. They couldn't have children of their own, and so they signed up with the adoption agency. And uh, they started pursuing adoption, and several situations fell through. And then Jessica got pregnant with their son Noah by a miracle experience, And uh, so they didn't pursue adoption any further, and they got a call from the agency. And the agency said, "Um, we have some children that need to be adopted. And Josh got off the phone, and he said to Jessica, there are seven. And she said, what do you mean, a seven-year-old? Wow, that sounds great. That's perfect. And he said, no, seven children, they're siblings, and they don't want to separate them from each other, and so what do you think about adopting them? And her mouth dropped open and her <laughs> eyes got big, and, and she said, well, we got to pray about that, you know. And she said, we couldn't sleep all night. And it wasn't because we didn't know the answer, because she said just about the moment that we were asked, we knew that these children were supposed to be ours. But she said, we stayed up all night because we knew these children were supposed to be ours. Ah, What are we going to do? So she said, the next day, they said yes. And they met the children and took the children into their home. And she said, you know, it's been an adjustment because we have a three-year-old and trying to help a kid with their homework or, you know, what a 14-year-old is going through. I, I just didn't really know too much about it, but we're learning. We're learning what it means to be the parent of the super seven and uh, extraordinary eight, I guess is what they are now, with their own child, Noah. And um, it didn't start out too well for these children because um, the 10-year-old daughter went over to the neighbor's house And there was a one-year-old up to a 10-year-old, seven children, and the 10-year-old was kind of trying to take care of all of them. And she said, our mother left a little bit ago, and we don't have any food in the house. And so they were taken into foster care, and they were tried. They tried to be adopted out a couple times, and it didn't work. Um, And now they truly have a forever home with Jessica and Josh and Noah. And we celebrate, you know, God's love. We celebrate the way that God just picks us up and takes us where we need to go. One of my favorite scripture passages when I think about what God's love is like is from Deuteronomy. And it says, like the eagle stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, God spreads the wings of God, to catch you and to carry you on its pinions, on the tips of the feathers. Can you imagine this, you know, that that there's the mother eagle and, and the baby is trying to fly overhead and faltering some, and the mother eagle just swoops in, you know, to catch the baby before it falls. And that's an image that we can hold in our hearts. And we can trust that this is who God is for us. And whether you are a parent or a neighbor, a mother or a child or a teacher or a Sunday school teacher, I know that you are doing the very best you can to nurture all of the ones that are 
entrusted to you. And we can know absolutely that when we fail or when it's time, we can offer up our loved ones into the arms of the quintessential mother and they will be received and cared for in ways that we couldn't even think of. And knowing this, it enables us to forgive ourselves for our own failures as parents. And knowing this, it enables us to forgive our mothers for the ways that they may have failed us in our lives. And knowing this, it enables us to let our children grow and move into adulthood to take the risks they need to take to be able to do that. And to believe truly that in the end, God will heal us and gather us up and shower us with kindness and bring us all together and heal all our relationships in ways that we can't even imagine. So happy Mother's Day to you. And I pray that that spark of the Mother God that brings forth the nurture of spiritual milk in you will be received by all that you meet. In Jesus' name, amen.
those guys. They're always late. I told them we'd eat on the way. They probably stopped at Dunkin' Donuts. So where have you guys been? I've been here for a while. Oh, uh, we went to Dunkin' Donuts. See? I was right. And, and then Jerry got peanut butter all over the map. So that's all you guys think about, huh, is food? Well, Jan told me to make sure we ate lunch on a long journey. Yeah, you know, trying this journey, flying with a suitcase full of these munchies, well, that's rough work. And you did say the journey could be a tough one. What I did say was... Hey, how did was, you get here so fast? Shortcut? Uh, I used my GPS, my God's positioning system. <laughs> What is this? Well, this is Journey. You know Journey. <laughs> the group Journey. We said we were going to work on Journey, so I practiced my favorite song and I'm ready for the tour. <laughs> no, stop. Stop. Do yeah. stop. Do stop. <laughs> All of you. Jerry and Al, you two packed like you're going to Disney World for a week. And Jason thinks he's on the line up for Woodstock. <laughs> Didn't you get my message? <coughs> you wrote something about a journey, and then my computer died. And I got the message from Al. <laughs> yeah, my phone was acting up. I only heard blah, 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 journey, blah, blah, blah. So I used my imagination. <laughs> my dear disciples, the message was and still is about the journey that we take as Christians. Oh! We, as the super disciples, <laughs> are on a mission this week to deliver the message to the young people about the journey of a Christian. is definitely more than music and munchies. It's about our ever-growing relationship with our Lord. Ever-growing and ever-changing. So true, like a path in the woods. It could be bumpy, it could be smooth, there could be a branch in your way. As a Christian, we look to the Lord for guidance. Yes, as it says in Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will make your path straight. Amen. Now, this journey doesn't always involve travel as we know it. It may be an evolving relationship, love and hate. How do we understand these emotions? This is where we look to the Lord for guidance. There may be a battle inside ourselves a question about our own strength, or a question about the strength of our faith. And this journey is lifelong. In the beginning, it says in Corinthians, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I set aside childish ways. As Christians grow in understanding about God and the world, they learn more about how to act and how to relate to the world. Amen. And we as disciples come here as, to be examples for the young. Even though we are further along on the spiritual journey, and some further along in others, 
Even though some are further along than others, we become examples to the young. Now, we are not perfect, but we strive to be the best Christians possible by following in the Lord's footsteps. Yes, trusting in the Lord is an adventure that takes your whole life, but it will give you a greater understanding of the world and its wonderful creator. Amen. Hey, Jason. Yeah, Tom? Maybe you weren't so far off with that journey song. Really? You want me to sing it again? Uh, yeah, 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 sure, yeah, go, okay, for, go it. for it. Don't stop believing. is Psalms 121. It's on page 536 in your pew Bible. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will never slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. And the second scripture is a reading from Matthew 4, 18 through 22. And that's on page 837. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. And the last scripture reading is Matthew 5, 1 through 16. There was a little mistake in the bulletin. And that's also on page 837. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteous sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men rev revel you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so men persecuted the prophets you were before you, or who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Bless these holy words just shared by Joanne were actually all three readings came from our Bible studies that we shared together while we were in Guatemala. 
And I'd like to thank Beverly for preparing those Bible studies for us while we were there. And um, we did have a great time in Guatemala. It was a very, very much of a learning experience. So uh, we'd definitely like to thank everyone who supported us uh, financially with prayers for allowing the trip to come. And uh, I'd like to ask everyone who was on the trip to come up to the stage now. And we'd like to especially thank Jan Duty. If it wasn't for her efforts and her calls and her research and everything that Jan did, the trip definitely would not have been possible. So at this time, we'd like to present a gift to Jan for all her hard work. Thank you very much, Jan, for all you. Yeah, you can come up, Jen. <laughs> so, so again, thank thank everybody for their support, and I'd like to have Jan come up, and we'll uh, begin our sharing of our experiences. Oh dear. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, each of us is, uh, or well, some of us are going to be sharing specific um, experiences we had. And we, as you can see, we have lots of visual effects um, to share with you. And please come up and look at them after the service. And we also have some pictures and things downstairs, as well as some Guatemalan treats for you to eat. So we're trying to make a whole experience of this. So when we were in Guatemala, we stayed at a very nice retreat center near the city of, um, near Guatemala City. And it was, was great. We had um, our rooms. <laughs> Crystal and I were roommates. And they were very nice, except that the beds were extremely hard. But um, it was, you know, better than camping, very much so. <laughs> and and um, we would, every day, you know, we would start off with Bible study in the morning at breakfast, and then in the afternoons, we would, I mean, in the evening, after the day was over, we would have another Bible study, and we would share um, our thoughts about what happened that day. And this is a Guatemalan pine cone. Right? Just, we used this as an object that we passed around so that we each took a turn to share what um, we thought about the, the day. So it was, it was great. We all did um, a lot of, um, it seemed like worship was um, part of everything we did. And it, it was part of every day. So it, it was a nice foundation for our trip. And then um, we received these, everyone got one of these little um, wallets at, at, the, at the ecumenical council that we visited. And we were asked at the end of each day to write a little thing on a piece of paper and put it in our wallet, which we did. And then on the last day, we all read what we had written. And everybody had such um, interesting and spiritual 
things to say as well as funny things. And so that was um, very meaningful, too, for all of us. Um, and we um, kept a journal. And this is it. And we took turns writing in it. Again, every day, somebody would take a turn to talk about what we did that day. Because we were kept very busy, and it was, would be easy to forget what we did and, and what we thought about it. So we were careful to document and, and to talk about it together, everything that we did. <clears throat> um, we visited the Ecumenical Council in Guatemala City, and they were our hosts. And it was um, a beautiful place, and it was, um, they, they do so much there. And I was really impressed with how much the Ecumenical Council um, devotes itself to issues of justice and poverty and, um, and, and um, different challenges that people in Guatemala face. And they are very courageous in doing this because it's a country where there's a history that if you... Um, do not follow the government, you can be imprisoned or killed. And we heard about those things. And so for these people to stand up, for instance, one of the speakers, well, and this is everybody that we met there, as well as um, this is our, during our time at the Ecumenical Council. And the man in the middle is Hector, and he was our interpreter, one of our interpreters. He was great. And then the woman on the far left is Nora. And she um, was organized the whole trip. And she was lovely, too. She was so wonderful to us. Um, and while we were at the Ecumenical Council, they presented us with this cross that we will keep here. Um, and it uh, just says that it's the um, Ecumenical Council of Christianity in Guatemala. So that was, that was really great. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to say about that part of our trip. And the next thing we're going to hear about is from Mark, our visit to the police archives. So upon arriving at the police archives, the building is pretty much surrounded by murals, uh, which are painted by the youth within that area, and they all depict um, thoughts and uh, the timeline of kind of what happened. Uh, they went through a 36-year war, uh, a civil war, uh, from 1960 to 1996. And... Uh, a good portion of the country is actually under the age of 29, uh, almost two-thirds of it. And so uh, they had lost a lot of people, uh, close to 200,000 people during this time. And uh, people became very expressive about these hardships. And so they painted all these murals. Let's just see a few more here. Um, they had uh, a couple of people who were very, very important to them. Uh, one of them was a minister who went up to um, the police at the time. It was a police that was run by the government um, who, in a way, was corrupt. And there was this, uh, the priest went and tried to absolve uh, a couple of people from what they had done. And they instead decided that they would imprison and capture this priest, torture, and kill him instead. And so he became kind of a, um, a representation for these people um, to continue struggling despite the hardships. <clears throat> so as you go inside the police archives, um, I can give you a little bit of a history of that. And so that was in July of 2005. Um, 
they happened upon an abandoned warehouse, and that these people were uh, the procurators for human rights. And inside was this vast archive of over 80 million documents. Of um, there was five rooms full, literally chock full of documents. Um, they're sopping wet. They're in really poor condition, and um, they have the full names, addresses, what the list of the crimes, and when, you know, using the quote crimes were. Some of the crimes were as simple as um, these people migrated, um, and they didn't have proper documentation, so they imprisoned them. Um, these documents they've been working on for the past 20 years, and or excuse me, 12 years, and they have about 20% of those documents uh, cleaned up and um, sorted, filed, and they're using those to now um, give some resolve to a bunch of people who lost family, who have no idea where they went, what happened to them. They just kind of disappeared off the map and um, haven't been heard from or seen again. So up there on the top right are people who have devoted themselves uh, to going through these documents and taking a very painstaking time to actually dry, clean, prep, organize, and uh, get these archived. And they also scan these. They digitally scan these documents. And they're held in Texas. And they also have a backup, I believe, in Switzerland. Um, it's one of the largest archives for Latin America um, based on uh, war crimes. And you can see in the lower pictures that they have just tons and tons of documents. And it's probably going to take them another 20 or 30 years to actually go through and finish the rest of the 60 million documents that they have left. Um, but this is uh, where you can actually see um, some of the travesty that kind of went on there because uh, this place also is where these people were tortured. So as you're kind of walking through the hallways, it kind of it's it's eerie, and um, it'll, it'll kind of creep you out a little bit, and um, you get a sense of the loneliness when you look in some of the rooms and whatnot. It, it's a it's kind of depressing, but um, it's extremely important um, for us so that we could learn what happened in that 36 years and why these people are looking for peace and why they're looking for resolution. I believe I'm going to let the next person speak. I'll help you talk about the shirt a little bit. <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind turning around. It pretty much says that there's uh, 20 years of uh, revolution, tw uh, 20 years without peace, um, and that they're uh, seeking resolve for the, their indignation, um, the anger that they hold um, against the travesties that happened you know, during the time. And uh, on the front, uh, they have a couple of things there that uh, there, it's uh, speaking, uh, new growth. <laughs> the, 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 the Ecumenical Council is looking for people to collaborate, to speak up and talk about the travesties. Um, they're looking to engage the youth. They're looking for new growth within the church, um, which they've been successful with. Um, a large portion of their church members are youth. It's, it's actually... Sadly, it's almost an opposite of a lot of the churches in the United States. Um, <clears throat> but that's essentially what the shirt is representing. Uh, they were very nice to give us these shirts uh, when we were visiting at the Ecumenical Council. Um, and so why don't you... Yeah, you can all hear me, I hope. No? Can't hear me? I don't want to. 
<laughs> All right, so we met up with the youth one day. I think it was Wednesday. And some of the youth, as you can see in the pictures, we created bottles. Um, they <laughs> The bottles are all recycled from restaurants and stuff, and they go around, the four of them and a couple of others, go around and collect the bottles and they create different items with them. They created like vases and cups and you can create like, they did a chandelier out of like just recycled wine bottles and stuff. And one of the bottles that we made isn't this one, or maybe it is this one, I don't know. Mark made this and we, Got all, we all got the chance to make them. We all got the chance to make different bottles, and Cynthia almost broke the bottle cutter, but they... <laughs> oh, my bad, she did break it. <laughs> but um, we got the chance to... They showed us how they cut their bottles, which is way different than what we do when we cut bottles, but, like, it was, like, I don't know, like, a good experience, like, to see, like, what they do to, like, recycle, because it's, like... Probably something that maybe none of us would have thought of, maybe. But yeah, that's kind of really all. I don't know what else to say. Talk about the games. The games we played. What games? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, no, we were too busy playing them. Another thing we did is we all we played a lot of different games. Um, one of them was called Sardines, which their version of Sardines is way different than what the youth group Sardines is. Um, to be honest, I can't remember what we actually did for that, but yeah. And then there's another one, I believe it was called Spider, I believe, and we all had to go up and get items around that spider without waking it up. And there was one incident with me and Mark, <laughs> and yeah, I was going to get the item and he woke up and the first thing he did was ran his big head into my head. <laughs> I had an egg on my head for a couple days. He, he had nothing, but, you know. Um, I will say, for a game that's meant for kids, I got hurt a lot. I, I did get her to laugh, though. <laughs> um, we all pretty much laughed, so we all had to start back and we didn't get that prize. The only two people who maybe didn't laugh were Ryan, Amber, and Crystal. We couldn't get them to laugh. And Mark, because Mark was pretty much a statue the whole time. <laughs> but, I mean, we did that and then we played with a baseball. We got it stuck in a tree. Oh, do we want to talk about that? No, no. We got it stuck, Amber got it stuck in a tree and... And then Izzy got it stuck on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. But because we got stuck in the tree, we tried getting it down. It took us quite a while. We finally got it down. I had to go up on Ryan's shoulders, but we got it down. It was all good. <laughs> but then I kind of did get it stuck on the roof, and we could never get it down from there. So it's up there permanently. And it's up there permanently. Um, that's pretty much all we did, as you can see, the pictures. The ones on the bottom. Next to me in the orange shirt, that is Chris. It goes Oswaldo, Maria. What's his name? Brazil. Yeah, him. <laughs> <laughs> and Jose. They are the youth, and they are the ones who do the bottles and the games and stuff. That's for nuts. Yeah. On a more somber note, um, I just wanted to talk about our trip to Guatemala downtown in the old city where we went. And we went to a cathedral and we saw the um, palace where the president lives. But then we went to this museum called the Museum of Memories. Um, and it was a very sobering experience being there. Um, it was devoted to the um, history of Guatemala and how much um, 
destruction there has been over the years. They, taught, they started off with the Mayan civilization, and we learned about um, how in the 16th century that so many Mayans were killed um, by the Spanish and their, their um, civilization destroyed. So that was the first thing we learned about, but then we also learned a lot about what happened during the Civil War and all of the people who were imprisoned and um, never heard from again. And there were thousands of people who, who um, were killed by the government for speaking up against um, injustice. So it was a very, I have never been to the Holocaust Museum, but to me, this is, is similar to that. It, but it was a very um, interesting museum. It, it, they, they, they had nooses hanging up and, and um, the, I don't know, it, lots of death imagery, but also a lot of life about um, the, 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 the human spirit and how strong people can be to stand up against injustice. So that was the House of Memories. And then we went to, we experienced the Weavers. So uh, what the Weavers are, it's a uh, group of Mayan women from uh, San Juan, uh, which is part of uh, Chimatenango. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> and um, but they're 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 professional weavers, and um, they it's what they do. They, it's their job. They're learning their how to weave what their culture in the past has done, and they're trying to preserve that culture. Um, their belief as Mayan women is where one or two women are is empowerment. And so that's what their their school and uh, Universidad, Jan, do you remember what it was? You don't remember? Uh, Kachik, <laughs> you say it. <laughs> Universidad de Kachikatel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And uh, that's their school where they're actually going to learn their culture, to learn how to weave the way that they've weaved for hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, they're trying to keep that tradition and they're trying to make it their, their livelihood. And um, some of the things that we received uh, from them as gifts were all the indigenous Mayan women you see any woman walking around Guatemala with a small bag like this, they're an indigenous Mayan woman. So they gave us these as gifts to remember them and to remember their uh, heritage. So you can keep that on your bag. Oh, gee, thanks, <laughs> um, They also make uh, scarves and table uh, coverings hand-woven, and the amazing thing that I found um, with their work is one of their cloths can take up to 30 hours to make, and how they how they make their um, cloths, I'm not sure if we have a picture, is their backstrap weavers. So they're sitting down, yes, there's a, uh, the lower left-hand corner, they're sitting down, and that's how they weave, and for hours and hours on end, so it's very tiring work. And for what we what we purchased these for, it was not a lot of money. So it's a, it's a great project that they're doing. It's keeping their heritage, and they're they're learning a trade to be able to to live by. And um, also at this time, I'd like to ha ask uh, Pastor Beverly to come up. And while we were at the Woman Weavers. Since Beverly could not make it, make it with us, we all decided that we were going to bring Guatemala and Woman Weavers back to her. So we all pitched in a little bit and we got your gift. Thank you. Oh, that is beautiful. Thank you so much. to not be able to accompany the group 
uh, what God wanted because I think that there were people in the group that discovered their calling in ways they wouldn't have if I had been present. So um, I'm really grateful to all of you. And thank you. Thank you. So, um, so that, that was pretty much the Women Weavers. Um, they, they were an amazing group, very friendly group. And um, just to think of how much work they put into all their, their projects that they do was just amazing. So, and um, off the top of my head, I don't remember all the symbols, but uh, each thing that they weave, they weave symbols into each item. And each of those symbols mean something from their heritage, which I thought was pretty cool. So. And in, I believe it's in all of their weavers, weavings that they do, Mark just reminded me of this, is there is the color red in everything that they weave and in everything that they wear. And the reason being is to remember the death and the, the loss of, the, of their heritage from the, uh, the Civil War. So. And um, Crystal was going to be talking about the migrant house that we visited, but she is on another trip, so I'm going to read her uh, journal entry regarding the migrant house. So today, we visited Casa del Migrante, which was the migrant house, and heard a presentation about how they help migrants and the various services they offer. The house itself had a beautiful garden in the center with an open roof and a little playground set. But the rooms for the migrants were so barren with about 20 beds crammed into each room. It didn't feel welcoming and felt more like a jail cell than a home. The rooms were all empty and we didn't see any migrants or any sign of living in the rooms. I wish we could have spoken to one of the migrants to understand what they're going through. I imagine it must be incredibly difficult. It was interesting to learn, however, that the migrant house works with the United Nations and has received refugees from Syria, Palestine, parts of Africa, as well as Central America. They have so little to give, yet they offer so much love and support. The house denies people who are not sober on drugs or alcohol and those who have criminal records. I understand this policy, but I also wonder where do these people have left to go? They are still human beings. So that was our, our trip to the migrant house, which um, again, it was very very jail cell like, like Crystal had mentioned. I was kind of surprised when we did go to see the rooms and it reminded me more that people were being punished than they were trying to help them out. They were small bunks, uh, two, sometimes three stacked and one right after another. So there wasn't a lot of room, wasn't a lot of area for privacy or anything and um, so it was kind of surprising to see how squished in they were and how, it, I understand they're helping them, but at the same time, it was, it's a roof over their head, but can we, could, couldn't they make it a little bit more homey for them? Would be kind of my thought. But um, at least they have a roof over their head. They're getting on their feet. Um, one thing that I thought was amazing is they're only allowed to stay for a certain amount of time. I believe it was 90 days, I believe. And um, after those 90 days, they have to be on their feet and be able to be self-sufficient. And it's, to me, 90 days isn't very long. It's a, a very short time. So in order to get on your feet in 90 days is kind of a little mind-blowing for me, especially if you're a refugee just being shipped back or something helping them out and everything is great, but it's kind of like, couldn't they do a little bit more in, in, in my thoughts? <laughs> and Jim.
also, on Friday, we got to go to Antigua, which is a beautiful um, city that was the former capital of Guatemala. And they have an active volcano, as you can see. Um, and we spent time in the square and um, talking, you know, buying things from many different merchants who wander around and have beautiful things to sell you over and over again. And, uh, and, and it was, I met a woman there three years ago and she recognized me. Wow. She came up to me and she goes, why are you buying from her? Don't, I'm your friend Ruth, don't you remember me? And I said, oh yeah, I do remember you, Ruth. I'm sorry. So I bought more from her. You know? So we had a great time in Antigua. We um, went to um, Finca Philadelphia, which is a coffee plantation. And again, um, <laughs> oh yes, this is just some comic relief from Antigua downtown. When we went shopping, oh, oh dear. So um, we went to the coffee plantation and got a tour. And we also got to, um, you know, have, have a, some iced coffee, which was great. And we learned a lot about coffee production and that there are 400 people who work there um, picking coffee. And it's, it's an amazing, they, they sell um, just thousands of pounds. And we saw the whole process from <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the bean to the picking it and hulling it and roasting it and everything. So it was really, really interesting. Yeah, those are the, the beans there. And we, our guide was um, Roberto. And I remember Roberto from, again, from when I was there three years ago, and I said to him, you were my guide three years ago. And he said, oh, no, ma'am, I've only been here for three months. And then he laughed. He said, no, no, I've been here 10 years. It's me. <laughs> so, um, and then after we... <clears throat> talk about the trip up the mountain, which um, was beyond scary for me. We left uh, Antigua after a beautiful day of touring around and then the coffee plantation and um, down on the bottom, well, all those pictures are at the top of the mountain, the restaurant, and the view was incredible. But we left Antigua and kept talking about having dinner on top of the mountain and I just had no idea what I was in for until we were actually on the road up the mountain, all jammed into this van, and we're going in roads like literally zing up the mountain. On it was so scary. I had to hold. I had to just hold my breath and close my eyes the whole way. Everybody else seemed fine. I, I couldn't quite understand it, but um, I I prayed all the way up and all the way down, and it worked. It got me there. And it was so worth the trip. It was absolutely gorgeous. Um, the volcanoes in the background, it was a little foggy. You couldn't really see it clearly, but it was incredible to get up there and see um, what it looked like. I just want to touch base on two other things. I'll make it really short while I'm up here. Um, I still can't believe I even got to go. When Cynthia, my granddaughter, first said she wanted to go, um, I was like, oh my God, I, I don't know if I can do this. And uh, once again, my fear you know, stepped in. And she was gonna go without me, and so I met with Pastor Beverly and, and told her how I really wanted to go, but I was really nervous about it. And she prayed with me, and um, it was meant to be. It was an amazing experience. These kids were so impressive. They all just handled themselves so well. Nobody killed each other or, you know. <laughs> It, it was an awesome time to spend with all of them. And then last but not least, um, our last night there, we went in to have um, something to eat and the woman that was helping with the food was wearing this poncho and I commented on the colors and how beautiful it was and she took it off and handed it to me and I went, oh, you want me to try it on? So I tried it on and, and I showed everybody and then I went to take it off and she, was, she refused, she wanted me to keep it. And I was just really touched by that. And Jan said, oh, no, you, you have to keep it or you know, she'll be offended. But 
it was um, it was an unbelievable experience. The people there were very very generous and um, have such great faith. It's it was awesome. Hello. Um, I was asked to talk about going to the market, and um, I do not think we have any pictures of the market. Do we? Oh, okay. The market. Me. Okay. Oh, we do have some pictures. All right. Um, so Janet talked about going to the market, you know, throughout the trip, and so finally we were going to the market. So I was very excited. And in my head, I was thinking, oh, it's just going to be very nice, and it's going to be fun, and we're going to buy things. And So we get to the market, and Jan's friend who lives in uh, Guatemala, she was our guide through the market. So we get there, and it was quite different than, I think, what we all expected. Um, we were kind of lined up. All, there was 12 of us all lined up. And we started going through the market, and it was enclosed, it was huge, kind of small aisles, and there were just people set up everywhere. It was, it was just kind of mind-boggling. And they had people with clothes, and then you'd go to the next person, and they'd have fresh fruit, and then they'd have chicken, like just raw chicken just sitting out there no refrigeration and the smells and and then you just keep going and there might be chicken feet for sale um so it was just like one thing after the next and we're all just kind of going jan's friend donna was leading us and we're going really really fast and i don't know it was i i felt really anxious and uh just the smells and the thought of any of us getting lost because it was just it was huge the market was huge so we just were going and going and going. It was almost like a little train going through all this. So it was, when I look back, it was kind of funny. And I was just so glad when we got out of there because I don't think we had any pictures like really right inside because I think we were all kind of just like, oh, just get out of here. But we did get out and then we went to a different part of the market and it was more um, crafts and um, homemade items. So that was... That was nice. It was a lot nicer. It was more like touristy, so it was quite different. Um, yeah, so that was the experience at the market. Um, I don't know if I'd ever want to go back to that particular part of Guatemala, but it was definitely an experience. And I just think of people like set up there every day, um, and that's their livelihood. And I don't know how much people, I guess the Guatemalans go there and buy things, but. I don't think a lot of the tourists were buying from um, the, the section that I was uncomfortable with. So I just think of their livelihood. And, you know, I saw little children just sleeping on, you know, with their parents and the kids having to be there all day long in such a smelly, kind of not very nice environment. But, um, yeah, it's a tough life in Guatemala. So thank you. So uh, I'm going to pick on Naomi a little bit here. Na Na Naomi was asked to talk about the market, and, and something she said in her speech, she thought she was going to buy. Buy, she did. <laughs> I thought we were going to need an airplane just to bring back Naomi's stuff. <laughs> Sorry, Naomi, I had to. <laughs> but uh, we're going to wrap up now. Um, each of us will share something that really stuck with us uh, from the trip. And... To close, we'll show some fun pictures, some pictures that we just wanted to pick out from the trip that we really didn't talk about in the uh, service. But uh, we did have a great time. I definitely look forward to going back. We met some really awesome people. Um, the faith and the caring and lovingness of people down there was just overwhelming to me. Um, we met Jan's friends, um, Donna and John, and one thing that I thought was amazing with them was they knew Jan, but they didn't know any of us. And they invited us into their home. They showed us around. They, Donna made us feel like we were her best friend as well as Jan. And it was just amazing the way that 
and it wasn't just Donna and John. It was Neo, uh, Nora and Hector, um, Hector's son, Hector Jr., made us feel like they knew us for years and were their best friend. It was, the love and the compassion down there is just amazing. Um, so that stuck with me. And also another thing that stuck with me is was the uh, talking about the police museum and the migrant house and how much despair there is, but yet still how happy and caring people are down there. Um, I think if I personally lived through what a lot of the Guatemalans have lived through, I think I personally would be bitter and not trusting. But when you go down there, it's completely opposite. They're very trusting, very caring, very loving. And it really stuck with me. And I think I brought that home and I kind of noticed myself being a little bit less push away kind of as I was um, compared to what I am now. I'm, I feel I have more patience toward people, especially at my work where I work. I work in a call center at Workers Credit Union. And prior to going, a lot of my phone calls I would be very short with. And I notice myself now having a lot more patience with people and trying to walk in their shoes. When they call in to me at work, I don't know what's going on in their life. They're having a bad situation. They just had noticed they have money missing from their account. And here I am sitting in my office. Okay, you're wasting my time. Let's get through this. Prior to going to Guatemala, now, now I notice myself trying to be in their shoes. Okay, if I looked at my account and I just noticed I had 100 bucks missing, I think I'd be freaking out as well. And prior to going to Guatemala and really kind of seeing the, the loving and the caringness of other people, I felt like I was doing a job, okay, I gotta get this call over with and get to the next person. Where now I feel like I'm sitting there trying to be more in that person's shoes of, okay, I don't know what's going on in their life, but I need to help them and I need to put myself in, them, in their shoes of how can I help them and be the best person that God wants me to be. So that's really what stuck with me from Guatemala. Next, whoever. <laughs> Jen, do you want to go? Cynthia, did you want to say something? Okay, I'll just say something briefly, because I know we're getting late here. Um, in Guatemala, they um, have respect for um, people who are elderly, and it's a real true respect. And in here, you know, we're used to making fun and joking about being old, and I do it all the time, because I am. And, <laughs> and yeah, and we were in our worship service, and <clears throat> the leader said, um, we really respect people who are older because of their wisdom and their experience. And he pointed to me and he said, I would like to ask you to light the worship candle because of your status as an older person. And I, I was so honored to do that. And then, um, and then the next day, I'm still making jokes about being old, you know? So, but at that moment, it was an honor and I, I really felt that honor. So um, thank you. I think we can move on to the next part of the service. Is that right? I'd like to now share our joys and concerns. <laughs> 